say thank you, Jesus. take time this morning just to speak to the Lord and say thank you. I am so, listen, I am so grateful for salvation today. I am so grateful for the blood shed on the cross. Just take a minute where you're sitting, where you're standing, and just talk to him a minute. Let's sing that again. Just talk to him. Speak the words, the words of gratitude. Thank you, Lord. Thank I you, Jesus. Just want to say thanks, thanks.
song on my heart. I, I, we're not going to try it. I went and got the hymnal and looked it up. We used to sing an old song in the church. I, I wish we had a, a hundred member choir here singing it today. It says Oh happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. I'm afraid, I'm concerned that in the absence of some of those good old songs, we have forgotten how to rejoice every day. Amen. How many of you here to rejoice? He taught me how. I want everybody to do that. I want everybody to turn your teachable spirit switch on. Because I think the Lord's got something to teach us today. I'd like for our ushers to come and serve you. We do this to facilitate your worship and your obedience and tithing and in giving. You will never hear any kind of manipulative speech on money or trying to get you know God just wants your obedience and we take what you give and we use it to fulfill the mandate on the church that God's given and Father we pray today not only for this offering but I pray Lord for the ministry that's going on to children 
that your Holy Spirit would move there. We pray, Lord, for what's going on in this room and in other rooms on the campus. We pray, Lord, for those that are not able to be here today, that you would keep them safe. For, Lord, we're a family. We're your family. And we give you praise. And the church said amen.
God says wait. Just wait. Because this thing, it ain't over yet. I don't know who told you you would not make it. I don't know who told you that you could not take it. I don't know who told you it's time that you quit. But my God says wait. It ain't over yet. It ain't over till I
Baptist Church. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, somebody. Come on. Praise the Lord. Quickly, I just want to tell you I love you. This morning, I'm glad to be in God's house, glad Woo. to be saved, glad to be sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, if there's breath, there's hope. If there's hope, there's life. If there's life, there's love. And if there's love, it's Jesus. Amen. All right. We got something to praise Him for. I want to say this. She's getting ready to sing a song that I experienced in this church gratitude how I went from thinking one day I, I'm not going to make it I'm not going y'all just sung that song a second ago somebody lied it's the enemy he may be lying to you right now because if you realize it from the Bible our worship is a weapon you can put him on the run just by one lift of your hand just by one word out of your mouth you can put the enemy on the run amen just by being thankful just by worshiping you know and I'm going to say this and I'm going to sit down but you see what the enemy intended to keep Joshua and the children of Israel out with this big entire wall when they decided on that seventh day, on the seventh time, when Judah and the ark went out and they shouted and the walls fell down, what was intended to be a wall became a ramp to their blessing. Amen. Somebody might be close from the wall falling and being your ramp. All it takes is one word. I thank him for everything he's done. But worship says this, even if you don't give me anything, I love you for who you are. I wish we had worship with gratitude this morning. I feel it all over the place. Would you just worship with us today? God bless you. Yeah. 
Don't you get shy of me, lift up your soul. You got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy of me, lift up your soul. You got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have. it all. You are worthy of it all. We give you praise. God bless you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. You have truly did what did what our brother told us last week. And in gathering together today, you have partnered with God and with His Spirit, and you've created an atmosphere. I love this atmosphere. Amen. I really love this atmosphere. It makes it easier to preach. Thank God for all of you, every single one of you. You are precious to us, and we love you and appreciate you. I want to talk this morning about joy, and I'm going to bring my 
my text from 1 Peter. You can read it on the screen. Or you can look it up, 1 Peter chapter 1. And I'm using one verse of Scripture. We're going to refer to a lot of Scripture today. And we're going to talk about joy. I know it's Palm Sunday. And I love Palm Sunday. But I will always do my very best to be sensitive to the Lord and to follow his leadership. When we study the Word of God, I want to lay a little foundation here. When we study the Word of God, when we study the Bible, many times we do what we call word studies. We study a word that's in the Word. Amen? And um, I've done that with this word this week as I've been studying joy. And um, since I was a child, I have... I have been intrigued by this subject of joy, and I've been intrigued by the verse that we're going to read here in just a minute. It intrigued my mind early when I began to say and repeat the words that it was joy unspeakable. That's intriguing to me. You know, peace that passes understanding. Joy that is unspeakable. How can you speak about something that's unspeakable? Well, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So I was, I was just wanting to share a little information. You know, when you do word studies in the Bible, there's a lot, there's a, there's a, there really is a lot to it. You know, I encourage people not to get too tangled up on the, on the version fuss, on the, version of the Bible fuss. I've got my own preferences. I'm not a big NIV fan because she was a virgin. She wasn't a young maiden. Nevertheless, I encourage people not to get too hung up because when you begin to look back into the linguistics, into the, to the translations, it can quickly become, uh, within ourselves, it can become overwhelming. But we know that God is not the author of confusion. And uh, most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Some portions were actually written in Aramaic. Uh, Aramaic, some people might say. Uh, the Hebrew was the language uh, of the scholars and of the scriptures throughout history. And as we come on up to Jesus' day, Jesus' everyday language would have been Aramaic. And... 300 years before Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph, the Septuagint was written, and that was just a translation of the Old Testament presented in common Greek. Then you've got later on the Vulgate, which is the translation of the Hebrew into Latin. Sometimes it can become a little bit overwhelming, and I'm making this point today because... We need the Holy Spirit to help us understand. You know, people say, well, God didn't speak English. Jesus didn't speak English. No, English didn't even come into existence until the 4th or 5th century. So you look back and it can become mind-boggling. And my intriguing, my mind works a little different than just about everybody. <laughs> <laughs> on the planet because then I think well what did what language did God speak to Adam then I think about well what language now there are some answers and there are people who study these things and know and I don't know about what language God speaks but God speaks all languages even even tongues of angels so I, I'm telling you these things this morning to say we need the Holy Spirit to help us. I always, so go, I always say, go to the source. All right, I'm going to look up the Greek. No, you're not at the source yet. Well, let's go to the Hebrew. No, you're not at the source yet. Let's go back to Moses. Moses wrote it. You're still not at the source. Because the Word of God was written by men, and men of God or individuals of God as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you this, why not just go to the Holy Spirit? 
Now, I, I, I believe in, trust me, I believe in the Word of God and reading the Bible and, 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 and studying to show yourself approved, a workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what? Rightly dividing the Word. But I'm going to tell you, we need the Holy Spirit to help us understand everything we read. And uh, I, want us, I, I want the Holy Spirit, and I've asked Him this week to help us understand what we're reading in 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 8 when he says this. He says, Whom having not seen you love. He's speaking of Jesus Christ. In verse 7 talks about the revelation of Jesus. He said, Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy. And in the New King James it says, Inexpressible and full of glory and in the King James we know it traditionally is joy unspeakable and full of glory so I've asked the Lord for the time and the help today for us to leave here with a better understanding of joy that is unspeakable I truly believe that there is a problem around the globe in the church world, I believe there is a major deficit. I believe that there is a major issue in the, word of, in the world when it comes to joy. Philippians 4 and 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Romans 15, 13 said, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And I say respectfully, please do not hear me in a condescending tone. That's why I asked you a while ago to flip the switch and let's put on a teachable spirit. There's nothing in my spirit, there's nothing in my mind, there's nothing in Ron Johnson that says, I'm going to straighten some folks out. That's not the way I approach this pulpit, ever. I'm not here to Tell everybody what I know and what they don't know. I am here to, with the help of the Holy Ghost, to stir our questions and stir our intrigue and stir our, even our curiosity. And I want you to understand that I am convinced we have a deficit of joy in the church of the living God. I believe that God meant for there to be an overwhelming sense of joy within the children of God somehow some people have even become convinced that God doesn't want you to be joyful now there's you can't back that up with scripture and I'm here to tell you we're going to read some of that today in John 16 24 he said until now you have asked nothing in my name ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. That's the will of God, is for your joy to be full. We're going to look at several things today. We're going to look at a few more scripture, but we're also going to look at what joy is. We're not going to dig into that very deep. We'll come back and talk about that more. We need an understanding of what joy is. Why? Because some people don't have joy and they think they do. Some people don't have joy and they're convinced that they do and they're living far beneath what God has called them to live. So we need to understand what biblical joy is. We also are going to look today at some joy killers. I'm going to look today at some things that will not only kill, the, the Bible says the enemies come to kill, steal, and destroy. And many times he, we, we call them joy killers, or I'm going to call them joy stealers. They've come in to steal. How many of you got some kind of security in your life whether it's your phone, your computer, your house, or a Smith & Wesson, you've got some security. Somebody say amen. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you, we, we need to be aware of the enemy that has come to steal our joy. Because if he can steal our joy, he steals our strength. There is no church without joy. There is no fruit of the Spirit. There is no gifts of the Spirit operating I, I've been around people that lost their joy, and I don't even like being around them. 
I have lost my joy. And he says here and insinuates to us that he wants our joy to be full. He even says that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. I want us to focus, as we build this, I want us to focus really intensely on John chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. And that, you, that your joy may be full. We're talking about two different things. We're talking about His joy. And we're talking about our joy. He says that my joy might remain in you. That verse tells me one thing. You can lose it. That verse insinuates and, and tells me that... Uh, the Lord is saying, I want it to remain in you. That must mean that it can get out. That it can escape me. And that I can lose my joy. And then he says that not only that my joy might remain in you, but that your joy that I've created in you might be full. That verse tells me not only can the Lord's joy be removed from us, but that even with joy we can have less than what he plans for us. Folks, I'm just here to tell you, I don't want 10% of the joy. I don't want 80% of the joy. I don't want 98% of the joy. I want everything that God's got for me. And since I was a child, I have understood that there is a joy that can be achieved, but I have often wondered where is the joy in the house of God. One of the things and one of the mistakes we've made is we think that when we come to the church is when we exhibit the joy. And we, if we're not careful, we're going to exhibit joy here, but we're not going to exhibit joy in the world. What we do here is a simple reflection of what we're doing out there. So if, we're, if we are living in despair and living in negativity, and, and living in defeat, and we come in here and we want to express joy. I don't want that kind of joy. That's cheap joy. Amen? See, we live in a world that thinks you can get joy by taking a pill. Or two or three. We live in a world that thinks you can have joy by drinking uh, alcohol. And, I, and that that's somehow supposed to... We live in a world that thinks that if you will have certain relationships or if you will be involved in certain sinful activity, that you will produce joy. But that's not true. The Bible says we're coming to a day where people are lovers of pleasure more than they are of God. Yeah, sin, the Bible says, produces pleasure for a season. I'm not interested in that kind of pleasure. I don't even want you to call it joy. It doesn't even compare to the joy of of the Lord. There is a joy that you and I can experience all day, every day for our lives, and we have to maintain that joy. Now, statistically and realistically, there are people in this room who do not and are not experiencing that kind of joy. The number is probably much higher than we realize. You're not going to have joy just because you sing a song. Absolutely not. No. The truth is the opposite. You're going to sing a song because you've got joy. The Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Bible tells See, joy can just bubble and bubble and bubble until a song comes out. Well, that's the kind of singing I like. I love, I, I've been thinking about that choir when I was a kid together in that choir. It was a little church with a large choir. How many of you ever been there? I mean, they would just pack up in that choir and they would sing, He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. They would sing that song and at first it might not really sin. It might not really feel like that they had found the joy. But usually when the Spirit of God would move, 
usually about the second or third verse and after singing the chorus about 18 times. And they, there's nothing wrong with that. But there would be that point when the joy would kick in. And all of a sudden hands would go up and tears would flow down and they would throw their head back and they'd say, He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. I'm hungry for that kind of joy back in the house of God. I'm hungry for that kind of joy. But you know, it doesn't start in the sanctuary. It starts in the temple. So we need to have a better understanding about joy. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here this morning. We're going to come back and and do an in-depth study of, of joy. The Psalms are filled with joy. The Gospels are filled with accounts of joy. Jesus himself declares that he came to give us his joy. We just read that verse in John 15, 11. He encourages us to ask God to make our joy complete. We just read in John 16. The disciples experience the joy of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The early church experienced the joy of miracles that were performed in the name of Jesus Christ. And then when the Gentiles came in to the saving knowledge of the Lord, they experienced joy. The Lexham Theological Workbook, this is just one definition, defines joy as this. Joy is the sense or the state of gladness or elation that people experience through their relationship with God and through good things in their lives. Lexham Bible Dictionary clarifies that this, joy is more of a state of being than an emotion. There are approximately 10 Hebrew and Greek words that are translated as joy in our English Bibles. And we're not going to go through all of those. We're just going to simply mention them to you. Once again, it's not the source but it's part of the process. And as you go back, we hear the uh, Hebrew word uh, simka, meaning joy, meaning mirth or gladness. And we talk and we hear the Greek word is the word that we're most common with, chara or C-H-A-R-A, meaning joy or gladness. It's, it's, it means to rejoice. It's closely related to that word to rejoice. Christian joy is more a state of being than an emotion. And listen, if you don't hear anything else I say, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. Christian joy is more a state of being than emotion. It is the result of a choice. Everybody say, I choose joy. I'm going to state right here, I believe the biggest mistake we make as Christians is we, we get halfway through our day and we have not chosen joy. I don't, think, I don't think we understand as I look, I, I'm, I'm 59 years old. I've been thinking about some of these things since I was just a little kid and reading and studying and I'm not an expert, but I will, tell, I will tell you this. I don't believe some people understand how important it is to have the joy of the Lord. Turn to somebody and say, it's important. No, it's, it's necessary. The Bible, say, the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Without joy, you don't have strength. Joy is the fruit of a right relationship with God. Maybe you need to write that down. Joy is the fruit of a right relationship with God. It's not something we can create on our own. It's not something we can fabricate. It's not something that we can clap up. This is one of the mistakes, and I I know some of y'all... some people are going to think I'm crazy before I leave here today, and some people are going to maybe just, just give up on me. But let me tell you, an emotional experience is not joy. And the problem we've created is that we think sometimes when we have an emotional experience, we think that that's joy, and we stop there. No, there's a joy that is a result of a relationship. Now, I'm going to tell you, I said a while ago, when the Spirit gets a hold of a song or 
a service, you can shout yourself happy and you can have joy in the Lord. I'm not denying that. I'm encouraging that. But we need to understand that joy is the result of a relationship. I'm not anti I'm not anti-Pentecostal, I'm pro-Pentecostal. But I believe it's built on an understanding. It's built on a foundation, and we have to understand, uh, and in this case, the joy of the Lord. I want to talk about some things that kill our joy. Now, if you want to study joy, there's many places throughout Scripture you can study this, but specifically the book of Philippians is a study on joy. It is the theme. I took, I took, this, uh, I took a course back uh, 30 years ago with Brother Paul Lombard and Lee, our Lee College Extension, and I took uh, the course on, I believe it was Ephesians and Philippians, might have been Galatians, I, I think Brother Melvin might have been in there with us. But the theme of Philippians is joy. If you really want to get a better grasp of this, study the book of Philippians. Now, I want to talk about some things because it's important that we know how to experience joy and what it is. But I think it's important that we understand the things that prevent joy. The things that destroy joy. These are attitudes and behaviors and actions that will... That will damage and that will completely sabotage the joyful experience. I know I'm pushing this envelope, but I believe there are some people who call themselves Christians haven't felt joy in years. They've settled for an emotion. They've settled for an experience. They've settled for something. They've settled for a memory. Of how, how much joy they felt in 1973. Honey, you can have joy today. Joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. So we're going to take a brief look at some things that hinder our joy. The first one we're going to look at is what we will call, and trust me, I get a lot of material from a lot of different places and uh, I, I appreciate how God uses people to help others explain, and, and I, I believe the Lord leads me and helps me to find these things. One of, if not the most prominent joy killer is unresolved conflict. Unresolved conflict. Do you know we're all going to have conflict? Paul, uh, Walter Atkinson used to tell me, he said, it only takes two men to have conflict. And then he said, and some can just have conflict all by themselves. It doesn't take a big church to have conflict. It doesn't take a big family to have conflict. Marriage, we all have some conflict. Paul dealt with this in Philippians chapter 1 when he talks about some of those that were against him and some of those that that were fighting him. You have to read that and study it, maybe even read it in a different version to help you understand what he's saying. Basically, Paul said, oh, well. You know, joy is a choice. And to resolve conflict is a decision. So how do we overcome unresolved conflict? Well, I'll tell you, one of the main challenges of unresolved conflict is that it involves another person. And they have to want to resolve it too. Now, if they don't resolve it and don't want to resolve it, there's still some resolve that you can get by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can, you can get that. How do we overcome unresolved conflict? Well, the first thing is we have to admit how we feel. And a lot of people don't want to talk about how they feel. They don't want to talk about how they, they feel. I was going to bring my cup and I left it on my desk. But, you know, we talk a lot about that emotional cup. If you, don't, if you don't have peace in your emotional cup, if you've got hurt and anger in your emotional cup, and, and you're not telling anybody how you feel, you just keep stuffing it away and stuff it away. Before you know it, you've spent years with anger. You've spent years with resentment. Before you know it, you've become bitter. Before you know it, you've become confused. Before you know it, you've become beyond frustrated. Before you know it, you listen, how much unresolved conflict 
might be in the penitentiary system today. See? The second way we overcome conflict is we have to communicate. We have to communicate. When people tell me that they're not good communicators, you know what I say? Keep trying. Keep talking. Keep talking. You got to keep talking. Number one, this is how I feel, and you have to talk. If there's, if there's conflict in the marriage, you got to keep talking. You got to keep talking without escalation. And when it escalates, you got to bring it back down. And when you got, you got to keep talking with one thing in mind, and that is to resolve the conflict. Some people, when they have conflict, they don't want to resolve it. They want it. They, they, they want to. They want to part ways and do their own thing and do this and, and do that. Well, we have to talk about it and begin. See, we've been taught that conflict is the doorway to intimacy. Well, I could tell you some stories right now, but I ain't got time. Sometimes it's like that blister on your hand. You're not going to get anything accomplished until you rub that thing and, and it burst. And when it bursts, then you can put medication in it, medication on it, put a bandage on it, and it'll go away pretty quick. Conflict is like that sometimes. Pastor, are you preaching on conflict? No, I'm really preaching on joy. But your conflicts, your conflicts and my conflicts are hindering the work of joy in our lives. It's hard to have joy and be at odds with your spouse. It's hard to have joy and be at odds with uh, your friends. It's hard to have joy and be at odds with yourself. And so the last way we overcome unresolved conflict is to forgive. I've got to go on. I've got a lot to cover, but I want to tell you this. Sometimes we want to move forgiveness up to number one and just forget all the feelings and the communication, and it doesn't work that way. You're not ready to forgive, and if you say you forgive, usually you haven't. You've got to work through the feelings, got to communicate, got to talk about it. And at some point, there is that grace that comes over you, and you are ready to forgive. Amen? Last week, you weren't ready to forgive. I encourage you to get ready to forgive as quickly as you can and thoroughly as you can because uh, that's what is required for us to receive forgiveness. So the first thing that hinders our joy is unresolved conflict. When the cup is full of conflict and the cup is full of bitterness or the cup is full of unforgiveness or the cup is full of bad memories and we keep bringing up those memories, keep bringing up what happened. You remember what you said back in 1984? She does. <laughs> he does. It's not that we forget. We just need to quit bringing it up. Amen. Somebody say amen. I know y'all listening this morning, but I'm here to tell you, I want, I want there to be a, a, I want God to create room in us for the joy of the Lord. The church that's going to win this generation, the church that's going to see revival, the church that's going to see the miraculous is the church that, all, that activates and walks in the joy of the Lord. So let me ask you a question. How's your joy? Let me ask you this. Have you checked your joy as much as you've checked your blood pressure? Your joy is more important than your blood pressure. And blood pressure is important. Some of us have to check our sugar. And we're looking for that magic number. <laughs> But sometimes I have to check to make sure I've got the joy of the Lord. And I have to pray and see God. So the first thing we mention is the unresolved conflict. Resolve it. Hear this, hear this preacher. If you don't hear anything, if you've got conflict in your life, hear me. Resolve it. Resolve it. No, I can't talk about it, boy. He blows up. She blows up if we talk about it. Grow up. And talk about it. Amen? This is serious business. The second thing that hinders our joy is when we compare with others. Uh, and it creates envy. To be envious, we compare as we, you can find again in, in Philippians, it's a great study, 
there was jealousy over Paul's ministry. And many times people compare and they create a room for jealousy. We need to remember some things. First realize that what God has for you is for you. I believe we need to just hear that again. What God has for you is for you. Do you know that God does not need another Apostle Paul? Think about it. No, our job is not to duplicate Paul. Our, cho- our, 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 our job is not to... Now, it's fine to learn from them. But God's got a calling for you. God's got a calling for me. I'm fulfilling that calling this morning, by the way. I want you to know that this is why this this teaching and preaching and this kind of ministry is what I was born to do. And a lot of people have all all my ministry people have wanted me to do this and do that and do more. No, I'm just going to do what God called me to do. And by doing that, we can create an atmosphere for joy in our lives. Don't let envy step in. Realize that God has something specifically for you. Secondly, we need to rid ourselves of comparison and envy. And we need to set boundaries. I I could spend a lot of time here, but I'm going to go on. Stop looking at what everybody else is doing. Set some boundaries. There's a... Paul wasn't always an apostle. Before he was an apostle, he was a violent man. He actually killed folk. But the Lord said of him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument. I want everybody to understand, you're a chosen instrument. The last, and God's got purpose in your life. And if you don't walk in that, then you are actually eliminating joy opportunity in your life. It it removes the joy. And thirdly, the last way to avoid envy is to understand that not everyone, again, is, is called to do or to be the same thing. We're not up here with a cookie stamper, a cookie cutter. We need to encourage people to be what God has called them. Yes, we need to walk in truth and we need to have doctrine that is sound doctrine. The third joy killer I want to talk about briefly this morning. It is so quiet that I feel like somebody's about to throw something at me. But I hope it's because you're listening. The third thing I want to mention today is complaining. Now, when the Lord was giving me this message, Brian, he didn't tell me it was going to be this quiet. And he deals with it again in Philippians. He deals with it again. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. How many think that we need to listen to that? It is impossible for you and I to complain and be grateful at the same time. No, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying. No, you, what you're saying, you can't say it without focusing on it. You can't say it without thinking it. We need to stop complaining. If there's something not going your way, pray for them. Amen? You know, sometimes I, I go in a restaurant and, 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 and the food's, might not be to my liking. Well, it's not my restaurant. Amen? People say, well, the church is not. Well, it's not your church. And it's not my church. It's his church. We, we need to quit complaining. You know, all the complaining about this world is not doing you a bit of good. You know what it's doing? It's stealing joy. I have found out that you can have joy with a Democrat in the presidency. Amen? I have even found out that you can have joy with a Republican in the presidency. Did that save me? (laughs) What, what What I'm here to tell you is that complaining doesn't produce joy. It's a terrible habit. And we need to remove it from our lives. Number four is pride. We need to focus 
on the fact that we were born for community. This is not about us individually. When we try to do everything on our own, we get frustrated and we lose joy. We lose joy because we can't. We can't do this. We, see, we were made for community. God created us to work together. Some people want to be the Lone Ranger. Some people want to do things their way. A lot of people, I'll do it my way. If you want it done right, do it yourself. Anybody ever heard that? And there are some things that are probably true about that. But folks, when we're prideful and we think we can do everything on our own, we forfeit God's strength in our lives. I am so dependent upon Him. The fifth thing that I want to mention that will steal your joy, He'll come right into your mind. He'll come right into your home. He'll come right into your life. And, and He'll steal your joy, and that is anxiety. And it's been several things that have been confirmed throughout this service today that He's wanting to speak to us about this. And, and, and once again, Philippians 4 and 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything. That's pretty straight. But in everything by prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I'm convinced that a lot of people don't have joy primarily for one reason. They quit praying. They just quit praying. You can't have, you can't, you, you, anxiety, anxiety, it's hard to pray and be anxious at the same time. Now, some people manage to do it until the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them. And, but I want to tell you, you and I have got an emotional cup. And, God wants this cup, I'm going to, for, the, for lack of a better term, I'm, I'm going to say that God wants your cup full of joy. You say, well, why do you say that? Because that's what he said in John 15 a while ago, that your joy may be full. Really, it's not me saying it, it's him saying it. But our joy cannot be full because there's junk in the cup. There's unforgiveness. There's bitterness. There's anger. And at the bottom of every cup, there's hurt. How many of you ever been hurt? You know, it's amazing to me how we tell people about the negative, but we don't tell people about the positive. What if we went around and everybody said, Well, hey, how you doing? Man, I am so full of joy, I'm about to bust. April says it sometimes. I think I'm just going to pop. I think I'm just going what, to... Well, what's going on in your life? God's blessed me so much that tears run down my face. And, and sometimes my hand has to go up in the air. Or sometimes I just wear... Why are you wearing that smile? Don't you know it's raining? I'm just blessed. I've got the joy of the Lord. But you know what? You know what we do? We tell people about the bad things. How are you feeling? Oh, I've never hurt so bad in my life. Y'all don't, y'all, y'all not gonna like me for preaching the way I'm preaching right now. But I'm gonna tell you, it'll change your life if you'll stop that. It'll change your life if you'll stop that. People say, "Well, this situation with this is just killing me." Quit saying that. Quit saying that. I told lady, quit saying it. She said, "Well, it is." <laughs> you know, it's hard to convince people to quit saying stuff like that. We're such creatures of habit, folks. We've got the joy of the Lord. We, he said, he said, in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I've got so much to be joyful about. I've got so much. I'm, 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 I'm thankful and I'm joyful today because He saved my soul. And I'm, I'm, I got a whole big list. I'm, I'm joyful because I was baptized in water. I'm joyful because I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm joyful because God gave me a beautiful family. I'm joyful because God gave me a wonderful church to serve. I'm joyful because you say, well, Pastor, you ever have any aches and pains? Well, sure. But you know what? I'm not aching all over. I'm not hurting all over. Just because my, just because my ankle hurts 
don't mean I can't praise Him because my elbows feel pretty good. See, folks, it's a choice. Joy is a choice. Joy it comes out of a right relationship with God. And when you and I don't pray, we can't maintain that relationship. Many times, it's because we got unresolved conflict going on in our lives. We're not talking about it. We're not, we're, we're not sitting down and having healthy conversation. We're not, we're not working through things. And Folks, we got to love each other. That's why he said, if you have all with a brother, go to him. Go to him. That don't mean get in their face. Hey, bro, I got an alt with you. <laughs> you know, you got, you got problems. Amen? But that happens sometimes. Tempers flare. That's why you got to talk about how you feel. You know, I hate the feeling of being angry. That's a strong word, hate. I don't like to use that. I don't enjoy the feeling of being angry. It creates hurt. and it create. So, what do we do? Pastor, how do I get the hurt? I've taught this a lot, and you know it. How do I get the hurt out of my life? Interesting, the Bible says, you know how you get the anger out of your life is by forgiving. But how do you get the hurt out? The hurt's at the bottom. I wish I could preach a little bit to every one of you individually. How many of you ever been hurt? Anybody ever said anything? And it just hurt. Anybody ever been neglected or forgotten or overlooked? And it hurts. So you know what? The Bible teaches us that the answer to the hurt is to come alongside someone and to comfort them. I've been taught that you cannot overcome hurt by yourself. That's what I've been taught. And the Holy Spirit is our comforter. So we, we as a church, what we need to do is come alongside each other, put our arms around each other, and say, I love you. I'm praying for you. Give each other comfort. Don't give each other a hard time. Give each other comfort. Come when, you, when your wife is hurt. Come here, Miss Lisa. When, when your wife is hurt, and she might not even be hurt at you, but she's hurt at somebody else, but she's taking it out on me. So you know what you do? Is you come alongside and you put your arms around and say, I'm sorry you're having a bad morning. We're in this together. I love you. And um, nothing smart, nothing sarcastic. That's not a time to be funny. How many of you know you can try to be funny and make it worse? But you comfort one another. And in comforting one another, the Holy Spirit somehow uses that. And then He comforts. And the hurt is relieved. Now you've got room for joy. Folks, I'm here to tell you that joy is the result of a right relationship with God. What this message and what this sermon is going to require, it's going to require, Brother Jerry, for some of us to examine ourselves. All right, there's something stealing my joy. What is it? I can just hear somebody out in the world, not in this building, of course. I can just hear somebody say, uh, I know what's stealing my joy. It's that sorry husband of mine. It's that sorry wife. No, no, no. Everybody say no. There's not a marriage that you can't, there's not a marriage that can't be healed. Doesn't always happen. I know that. You say, well, if I just had better neighbors, watch, be careful. God will send you the neighbors from Hades. You better be careful. Well, if we just had a different pastor, be careful. <laughs> Folks, my, my desire in life is to see people have the joy of the Lord. It's to see them walk in peace and to have the joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. I wish I could just take a, a shot and inject it into them. Yeah, I wish I could do that. But you know how we do it? This right here. Stand with me if you would. See, in the days to come, 
you're going to have to have the joy of the Lord. I'm not going to make you stand long, but I, think, I just looked over here and saw April, and I thought about those people over in Africa. You say, well, most of them probably ain't got a dollar to their name. Honey, most of them had never seen a dollar. But they've got joy. It, it's, it's, it's the most unbelievable thing. You can have joy today. It's about your relationship with God. How many of you glad that He forgave you of your sins? I, I heard a preacher preaching on joy, and this is what he said. I want everybody just to come up here and get some joy. That's what he said. I'm not saying that. I, I'm not being... I'm not picking him apart or being real negative, but I want to tell you, you can, you can get joy right where you are. You can get joy just having a relationship with God. You say, Pastor, there's a lot about God that I don't understand. Well, get in line. I'm 59 years old, and I understand less than I ever have. I'll just be honest with you. No, I, I, I don't like being around people that think they've got all the answers. I want a relationship with God where I can ask Him and walk in Him and hear His Spirit. And He helps me in His time. Now I'll ask you this before we go. How many of you would raise your hand and say, I need the joy of the Lord in my life. Father, I pray over this flock. I pray, God, that the joy that is unspeakable would pour into their lives. And Lord, I pray that you would help us all to deal with whatever is hindering and whatever is stealing. We need to come against the enemy, Father. You said in your word that we can resist the enemy and he will flee from us. And Father, collectively and together, we just want to place notice on the enemy of our soul and the enemy of our church. Devil, you're a liar. We say in the spirit realm, let it be heard. Every demon in the heritage, every spirit. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against demonics. And we wrestle against the things of the spirit world. And we say to you, you're a liar. And you will not steal my joy. Now, I mean business, church. I'm just here to tell you I mean business. I'm tired. I'm tired of the enemy stealing my joy. Who does he think he is? I'm, I'm going I'm to let you go. Let me ask you this. Anybody ever had somebody break in your house and steal something? Oh, there is a feeling. Well, you know, I had, a, I had a chainsaw stolen. I didn't even like the chainsaw. But it was mine. And somebody stole it. I mean, I was praying that they cut their arm off. <laughs> I had to... I had to pray through about that. But I, I, I will tell you this. I prayed through about that. I will tell you this. I will tell you this. The enemy is trying to steal your joy. Now, what are you going to do about it? Give God praise in this house. Give God praise in this house. What was that song we were singing that me and you were singing? Um, joy. Not, no, it was, no, it was from, our, from childhood. Now but I've had all this music going on, I can't remember. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. And so let's keep this joy. Amen? I want you to go and fellowship together. Miss Lisa has got something to say. I sure do. Children's ministry, we have launched a, a new uh, <laughs> offensive, and uh, it started today. We, we need your help. We need your involvement. We've got the month of April filled up, but we need helpers. We need people. who and Maybe you could just do one service in a month. That's the whole idea behind this is that it won't overwhelm any one particular person. Sister Amber has stepped out, but she is our coordinator. I want children to know. You say, well, who's the children's pastor? I want children to know that I'm their pastor. That's where I'm at. I want, I want children to know. 
and I want children to grow, and we need your involvement. Anything else? I was, so in, I was so encouraged Sunday, and I know we're on Facebook, but you can pause it if you want to, but uh, I know last Sunday we were in our meeting, and here come James, here come James Dito, 